Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Star Citizen Live Game Dev, Building NPC Behaviors. I'm your host, Jared Huckabee. And if you've never seen Star Citizen Live before, it's where we take about an hour out of the end of our week, uh, hang out with some of our esteemed Cloud Imperium Games developers, uh, either answer some questions, do a little back and forth. Sometimes we take a look at what they are working on. Today, we are doing something that we've never done in the seven years I've been doing this for, for CIG, we are going to look at the actual process of creating NPC behaviors. And to do that, we are going to first uh, introduce ourselves to some of our AI team folks. Uh, Fran, bec uh, because you've been on the show before, we'll start with you. Uh, who are you and what do you do for Star Citizen? Sounds good. So, uh, hi everybody. My name is Francesco Roccucci. And I'm the AI director in uh, Cloud Imperium Games. So yeah, well, I try to supervise all the AI development and you know, help everybody with the with the proper planning, you know, the proper development of uh, architecture, and yeah, support everybody in the behavior, you know, creation as well. Let me see that shirt you're wearing. What? Sorry. Let me see that shirt you're wearing. So this is a very nice version of the Space Invader game. See. With Vincenzo, this is a tar. <laughs> how, how do you pronounce it, Jared? Tar, in English, tar grid, tar. A tardigrade. Uh, tardigrade. A tar. Exactly. I can never pronounce it correctly in, in English. In Italian would be tar tardigrado. I, uh, we'll, we'll go. We'll go clockwise around. Uh, Dan, who are you, and what do you do for Star Citizen? Hey, I'm Dan Baker. I've uh, been working at CRG for about four years now. I'm, I'm one of the game designers here. Uh, currently working on the NPC behaviors, as um, you know, this this uh, this whole stream is about, and working on usables. And I spend most of my time writing design documents and playing around with data. Exciting, uh, Jacob, the yep. man with the blurred background. What are you trying to hide? <laughs> oh, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. Who are you, yeah. and what do you do so, for Star Citizen? Uh, I'm Jacob. I'm a Uni AI programmer, and I joined here about uh, three months ago. Uh, so it's it's my first uh, like full time job. It's my first job in the, the games development sort of sector, uh, and I basically I work on um, behavior as well, like AI behavior, but also like sort of the you know the backbone of it, like the implementation and the code and stuff like that. So excited to be here. What we what you right now see already live with the with the pilot security behavior is what Jacob has worked on already. Yeah, exactly. So if you have any complaints, you know, you should continue. <laughs> Uh, no nope. finger pointing. And last, <laughs> last but certainly not least, Hayden, who are you and what do you do for Star Citizen? Hello, I'm Hayden McElroy. I'm a junior technical designer, and I basically do what Dan does, just with a little less documentation. <laughs> just a little yeah, less. And the higher up you go, the more documentation you have to do. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Lucky yeah. you. And uh, let's go ahead and mention uh, Idris. Idris was going to join us today, but he's having some trouble joining on Zoom. Uh, so Idris, you're with us in spirit. Uh, all right. So Fran, this is cool. uh, this is your program. Uh, we're yeah. all here to peanut gallery and, and just tell you where you're messing up and what you're doing wrong while you work. Uh, no pressure, and no pressure. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 why, don't you, why don't you start us off? What is an NPC behavior, and, and what are we so, doing? So uh, sure, uh, basically, I think like all of us here uh, work both on you know uh, some of us have, again as a program, I work on some of the systems uh, we 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 define, we design, and we build, and implement. Some others, you know, as the designers are mostly working with these systems we build, uh, and they you know help us uh, building. Uh, so the behaviors are mostly it's mostly the brain of the NPCs, right? So the way we split the team is we try to build, first of all, as much as possible, it needs to be data-driven to scale up, right? In this game, it's, it's so huge. We need to just, you know, allow the designers and content creators to create content that we use automatically, right? To patch the game and explain the game. And one of the things we want to show today is something that me and Dan have been working on, uh, you know, since a while. And I think we also show some sneak peek during the, um, mostly during the monthly reports, but is the, is the engineer behavior as an example of how we build a behavior from basically scratch, right? So how we define mostly what we want an activity to do, because we talk about behaviors in terms of activities, usually. An activity is kind of a generic, um, 
kind of a representation of a job, right? It could be the engineering job, it could be the pilot security that Jacob has worked on or the tourist that Aiden has been working on, uh, something that the NPC can do. And that, you know, eventually, I, I'm sure like a lot of people that are watching here, they saw the Tony's, uh, Tony's video, I know that was, was out this week and, you know, all these things with the population manager, oh, Idris, join us. Um, but they say all this uh, uh, really cool population manager, you know, and the visual NPC and something like this, we can basically spawn them in the right context and their context is the activity of what they are, they are trying to do and the environment which they are in. So, yeah, basically that is what an, an, a behavior is. And to achieve that, you know, let's say an engineer, you have a lot of pieces that, you know, we have to take care of that is like building the environment or making sure that the NPCs understand the environment as well. And, you know, and then there is the actual decision uh, logic, decision flow. And what that means is that we try to abstract our like thought process flow is like, oh, I want to find something that is broken. I want to repair something that is broken. And then how that basically construct the actual action that they need to perform, it tries to be as generic as possible, as modular as possible. And this is what we will see today. All right. Well, it sounds like something relatively easy, straightforward, and uh, yeah. should have no trouble doing it within an hour. Yeah, so I try. I try my best to be fast and not, you know, uh, because I'm, 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 I as a lot of people know, I talk a lot. So <laughs> you guys need to try to interrupt me sometimes. If I right. just speak too much. Yeah, cool. I think we're gonna try and squeeze like months and months worth of work into an hour. So. <laughs> yes. So we are trying to focus on specific stuff. We'll see how much time we have. Of course, we can go more in detail. Maybe Jared, you know, you can book us for another session after this. You know, we can hey, go more in detail later. Hey, I gotta do this every Friday. So. <laughs> All right. So we've got your screen share up on the uh, up on the uh, cool. stream now. What what where do we start? So we start with this is our engine, right? So this is uh, I think you know. You know, I've been seen in the past, but basically this is an empty level, just like completely empty. This is what we use for testing, for development, and for actually trying and testing the proper environment. So what we we'll do today, of course, is building a test environment. First of all, we need a platform where to be, because right now, if we jump in game, we're just floating in space and there is just pretty much nothing, uh, you know, we, we can do. So we will use what we call designer's tool that is like a kind of solid creation tool. We can create like a platform. Uh, and the way you know we move around, we can build like uh, different type of uh, surfaces. Now we have an environment where we can place NPC. Now we are still in zero G, so if I still jump in game, I will still float around. So first thing I want to do is add some gravity. I will go in the entity panel. I will search for what we call the gravity box. We drag it in. As you see here, there are like these little you know this little square is where now gravity is. So if I Go next to here, you know, and I will jump in the game. I'm here, cool. So I'm perfectly in the level. I can walk around. Let's take an NPC, as the company, you know, is is very complex in the process that we have to create from the character to the behavior. So let's say, usually, what we start is I'd say we want to do an engineer. In the in the parallel process, we have the character team that creates, you know, the character like as a, the human body, and then all the loadouts that the engineer comes uh, comes with. So in this case, we can just grab like one of the engineering. Uh, in uh, New Babbage, I don't know, or something like this. There are female and male, of course. Uh, we can start with, you know, picking a female, but I think I will show you basically that we are in the process of testing. Uh, always like, basically we start with some animation this male or female, and then we transport that animations to the other type of skeleton rig. So some might be, you know, uh, depending on the, on the time in which we, we're working on that might be more or less polished because of course we want to polish one first and then uh, do the retarget, retargeting. So first of all, now we have this, this character and that's what I wanted to show you is basically in each tar uh, character or each entity in general, it depends on the entity type, we can configure some instance properties and some are, are behavior related, right? So the one that we can show you here is that this is like is now assigned a behavior that is called PU engineer or better an activity that is called PU engineering. This is the old activity that we have sometimes in PU where you see some of the engineer going around, you know, and use like some work zone and you know weld stuff and and, and something like this. But now we're working on a more complex one, and we will definitely start with. Um, with none, with a new one. We would just create one from scratch. So to create one from scratch, 
we will go into uh, subsumption. This is our um, tool for creating behavior, missions, uh, you know, populate environment, what we call the object containers, where we can create platforms. We can define which type of actions the designers have exposed from the coders, which type of variable they can use, and so on and so on. But let's start with one. I take my, my folder I show, I make a new behavior. I call it engineer guy show. This is gonna be the name that we can reference to the inside the engine. And we can assign it to here. And in general, like everything we do here gets live uh, uh, hot reloaded. So if right now, for example, we take an, a sub activity, we go, we get a generic one that is like, if nothing happens, if he has nothing to do, it just goes into idle. We put priorities. This is like the number um, in which we evaluate those the, the sub activities. So what are sub activities, of course? Sub activities as a sort of the way we split the activity into the different things they can do. So let's say we have an engineer, maybe you have like, again, an idle sub activity that represents your fallbacks. Like, okay, there's nothing to do. You're just gonna be there. This pretty much should never happen. So we will put it like in a very high or very low uh, priority that is a very high number. And what we usually tend to do as a first step, we just put like, these are all the nodes, all the things that we can uh, put in the logic. Let's put, we call one that is called halt. Halt is pretty much doing nothing. It just stays there. The behavior runs and it's gonna be there forever. So what we're gonna test if this is already working. We jump in the game, we have this character here. If we jump in the game, what we can do, we can look at the character because this is gonna be a very easy thing to debug. And we press on our keyboards, we have like the slash on the numpad. And basically what we can see is like there will be on screen some information about the behavior. Here you can see of course, like this, the, the the log, but on top, you can see the name of the activity that is engineering I show, the one that we just created, and the primary sub activity name that is uh, staying in idle. There's no special variable. There is something on the bottom. They can see that it continues to run. That is like how many seconds the sub activity has run or the sub activity uh, you know, started. So now we have a really basic things that kind of works. Of course, it doesn't do anything. Um, so what we want to do is right now, we want to verify if this character can move around because if he can't move, he's definitely not gonna be able to interact with anything. What we usually do is that we have this AI physics button that allows us to move in the environment, but also to interact with the object. So right now the behavior is running and we have like a middle click button. that if we press around, the character should move, but we see it's like, eh, it's not really moving. So what's going on? We didn't put navigation mesh. So what's the navigation mesh is the representation of the environment to, for the eye basically to be able to move around. How we do that is we, we create a volume pretty much around the environment. We can decide if we want to snap uh, to the ground, to a grid, just right now, just put it, uh, we want to keep it on the solid. And uh, we just create like a, a square around the, the character. We can move it a bit down. We can sink it a little bit more. We save, so it's good to practice save all the time because you know, never know if it crashes eventually. And we can the back like draw like this one. As you can see, there's this blue <coughs> like uh, square and we can see how it's, how it's implemented a bit more. Um, sorry, there's like a bit out of my screen. So if we see this is our um, console, we can see like uh, CVARs uh, that are like a way for us to control the environment. And um, the back draw, we can put like three. It's usually showing us what, how this is represented internally. That is like tiles and triangles. So the eye usually when it moves around to the environment, it creates like a path that is just uh, transitioning through those triangles or through those tiles. If we middle click, now if we run with shift middle click, we can make the, the walk movement and we can test how the locomotion works. And with alt, we can just make it sprinting. And we can just like very easily test, you know, if the movement is, is working as we expect. Cool. So we have like just the basics. What do you think, Jared? All clear so far? I think we're halfway to our uh, Star Citizen RTS. Yeah, like exactly, we exactly. This recording for new starters. We could. We could. <laughs> it's actually, I was thinking the same when I was preparing it. it so I think. Oh, oh, you have no idea. One of the th 
how many, how often I get messaged from new employees who are just starting and like, hey, Jared, I just want to say hi. I'm like, I learned about the project from watching your videos, and I like, I decided you were the place I wanted to work at because of the videos. So yeah. It, it, it is it, it is helpful yeah. to show these tools, right? Because I think sometimes we are also like so much deep into development that. You know, we should just sometimes spend a little bit more time to record those things even internally that, that would help a lot. Uh, but it's good to use these things. At least it gets, you know, a bit more broader view and it's always good. Yeah. Yeah. So now we want to have something to do for this engineer and a way to have something to do is of course defining, you know, what they should do. That is the designer in charge and maybe you can tell us something about what you would like him to do or what usually an engineer does for us. Uh usually would i guess he would go to something and fix it check yes it out, exactly it. so this is exactly what you know what we what we do that then basically design it in a way in which basically the engineer is supposed to of course in our game to get tasks to do and it's usually repair stuff right this is what we want them to do so you know, one thing that yeah, Sorry, Fred, I was just going to say, like, the, the key corners, we, we tend to try and find, like, a key cornerstone of every single behavior. Like, what what is the purpose for having this behavior? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you know, there's there's nothing really unique about them, and they could just still be running the same behavior. So so with the engineer, it's more about, well, they, they can do everything like everybody else, like, the you know, getting changed into whatever the relevant clothes are or, you know, finding somewhere to sit if they need a rest or things like that. But, but for the engineer, it's all about maintaining things you know they yeah. their their job is literally to um inspect things to see if they're broken yeah. repair a, things if it's a it's, it's an archetype yeah yeah I guess. exactly is that, the, is that the word yeah we basically yeah. use like uh, yeah like um we call it activities but yes it is it is a sort of an archetype of you know a job to do and in essence i think what is good is that they actually i think compared to lots of games where I think we like yeah usually tends to do stuff but it's not really having an impact on anything right what we are trying to build is something that you know whatever action they do actually has an impact on the game so what we want to show today is like you know imagine we have a wall panel that is split between two different sub elements that we call relay and this relay can have sub components inside that are probably like in our test are fuses these fuses can actually have gameplay impact, right? And they can break for different reasons. Then you as a player can go there and replace it. If the eye does, it has the same exact effect as you know what the player would do. So for example, if you hire this guy and you, know, you want him to be your engineer your, or on board of your ship, you can then give him command and say like, you know what, maintain all the wall panels in my ship. Or, you know what, I see in my you know uh, map, that this wall panel is broken, can you repair exactly this one? And this is how we are building these behaviors, that they are sort of API of interface where you can control them. It does, in essence, it's like designer writing a mission are kind of doing the same as a player would do when they you know, give commands to an NPC. So right now, what I prepared, just to speed up a little bit, uh, of course, I prepared also some pre-configuring in case we don't have some time, but the idea is like I have some default object, let's say, you know, art, creates for us some objects that we can use as a reference. In our case, we have three objects. That is the wall panel, the um, actual sub-component, like that it will be diffused, and the relay. So I will show you all of those right now. Um, and also, just just um, for anybody else that's watching, that relay could be any kind anything. of ship component. It could be a quantum drive. It could be a shield generator. The, the idea is that, you know, this the wall panel is supposed to house any of those type of components and it could be in any environment the engineer is is more of a infrastructure um maintenance person versus exactly. a mechanic that is more like you know small ship maintenance so this one basically yeah yeah absolutely and this is like you know one of the example we use today and uh, you know the the relay for example right now is going to be done something like this uh, sorry entities just prepare something we show so at least I can find them very quickly. You know, we have something like this. And as you see, it's like it's a little box, you know, where with some uh, movable parts and inside you can find some tree component attached. How we do this one, probably art already can deliver us like something with a default loadouts where, you know, we can in our, for example, in this case, this is the whole panel we attach. We have to, let me put the whole panel as well. These people can have like a visual reference to that. Um, 
basically uh, dual panel template. You see, you have like two relays attached to, to a panel. And then inside each relay, you have three uh, subcomponents. And what we want, of course, is like, we don't want to hard code any information is like about repairing a specific wall panel type was three, you know, two relay and then three specific um, uh, fuses. We want this to come from the setup of the object. And this is what we will build today. So what we'll create right now is those are not usable yet. Those are just piece of art. Uh, we want to make sure these objects become usable, basically. So the first thing we will start with is I would say we start with the fuse because it's a bit the simplest one. So as you can see, we can select things, delete, and now we will go in data forge and we will open the, the fuse. We will create a variant uh, that we will configure. We call it template show usable. We'll make a new version we add right now the usable component. What's the usable component? I think we speak about this lots of the times, you know, about what the usables are. In essence, a usable is the knowledge that the AI has about how to interact with that object, right? So in our case right now, we have a, a, a fuse and we want to, this is an object you can carry. So the way right now in a simplified way we want to just generalize this as an archetype is that it's a carryable object right so we can take this one we can just select this is a carryable object then what we do is we want to create what we call alignment slot the alignment slot is the position in which you need to be to interact with that object now right now we are not going to care about interacting with this object by itself we will interact with this object through other objects that is the wall panel. So in this case, we would just create like a generic uh, uh, alignment that we call main, and we will reference this one as the root. The root is really the entity position basically. And if we go in here and we drag this new object that we just created, show usable, and now, for example, we debug draw usable dot debug draw. Of course, nothing goes there because we need to also enable the debug draw for carryable object because otherwise there's just a, a, a lot of information here. And now you will see there is no alignment slot because the alignment slot alone doesn't doesn't it doesn't do basically any information. It's not you can if there is nothing to interact with, then there is no point of even showing information. So what we'll do right now is also adding what we call use lot. The use lot represent sort of a virtual position in space, or you know, again, if it's virtual, it's virtual, but it could be a physical position where the interaction actually works. In our case, it's basically the center of the object. So you can interact from a position in that object, but no more other, like no other people can interact with that at the same time. So there is no way to have two people positioning at the same time around this object to, to interact. So you don't so have we multiple call it, NPCs all going trying to the fight for having at the same time. That as well, exactly, right? So we will make like a use lot that is called main and we will instantiate which type of use channel we can use on those objects. And right now what, the, the things that we care, I think we, like, we won't even have time to show them both, but let's say we can take this object and repair this object, right? So if we search here for take, we see that we have different type of archetypes of the usable and different action. What we want to use is the carryable take in this case, and we assign the alignment slot from which you can take it. And then we make another one. And we basically do repair. And then we make this one. We save, go back to the to the level, delete, we just put it back. And now you see you have the back throw happening, right? Now, one thing that we want to extend, of course, that we don't have it yet, is that these type of objects that they are carryable, they should have their alignment slot depending on the position of the object, but not on the orientation, right? Because the orientation is irrelevant. If these things fall, you might still need to pick it up from whatever position. And this is what we will extend in the next uh, quarters. Uh, but right now, let's say we are not planning to interact directly, so it, it's, it's a bit irrelevant. Cool, let's go now to the relay, right? So we take the relay. 
and we do a similar things. Create a new variant to show usable. We make a usable component, we assign it. So this is for, I was not super familiar, you know, with components, it's mostly there is this dichotomy in, uh, in programming that is about, uh, you know, inheritance and, and, and uh, composition approach, right? So usually most of the things, you know, are inheriting as a functionality from something else. Like you might have like a vehicle and then from your vehicle you inherit and you create a car or, you know, a, but then what happens is that the things are in a way simpler, but a bit more monolithic. What we try to do here is like we try to get this responsibility on the component so you can build it out of the composition of, of this extra functionality together. So in this case, the relay, this could be multiple things as archetypes. The way we tend to do is like we try to use what we have if we do have something that kind of fits. And then if things change, we might need to create a new archetypes. In this case, very much like we, we, we can imagine that we can still carry this relay. It's gonna be heavy, but you know, some people might be able to carry maybe with like, you know, an armor suit or whatever, then attach it to multiple, you know, things. So it can still be a carryable. It might still just be, uh, I don't know, a container type, but we, you know, right now we use a, a carryable just for simplicity. And we do something similar uh, in this case. We make the carryable, we create the alignment slot, since we are not planning right now to interact with this immediately, it, it is a little bit irrelevant about this one. It's mostly this information is required by the system to be able to understand how those things are attached and how they flow into one, one another. So this is why it's, it's important. And uh, yeah, we will make the use slots as well in this case. Uh, we will call it take, uh, sorry. Uh, this would be still a main use slot and then We'll have a take from the carryable. We'll assign it to the right alignment slot. These hierarchies then, are, I mean, you can't understate how important they are to making all of this actually function. You know, how often is a hierarchy you know, broken because you, you have to create 20 different links in order to make these things and one of the 20 links is broken and the whole thing doesn't work. Yes, and the problem is often, I'm sure like, you know, Dan or Aiden or Idris can, can say more, it's like, it's so easy to even like get lost sometimes on why things don't work. And I think we are basically constantly trying to say like, okay, okay, this is like, this is the problem. So let's try to add some extra the back throw to try to track it easier next time. You know, and we try to do that or like, oh, this is like the, the message is not really clear, right? Then it's like, we had yeah, to do this. The, the most simple thing ever, it could just be you're missing a left tag you're missing a right tag and then you'd spend half a day debugging it and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, it was just that. And you missed this one little field where well, yeah, there's a lot of information going into these usables. So. You, you can spend quite a bit of time just breaking a single entity down to its core parts, just saying, okay, well, this is okay. So you take that out and then you put a different thing in. And that's, it's a bit like if you're building a PC and you just swap out different components just to see which one's the broken bit. Yes, absolutely. That, that is usually a very good, um, like, you know, easy way uh, for debugging stuff. Like you start to remove it and say, eh, is this one that broke it? You know, or like just do a little step at a time. This is what I try to add here is like this I parse the bag draw just to show you guys like the, we have, like these I objects are attached to some item parts, right? The way we, we define those are, uh, for example, if we go in here, we do have this item part container for the relay. And we can see that we have three slots that we call slot sub item one, slot sub item two, slot sub item three. We can attach stuff in. Now we just need to explain to the usable code, basically how this information is, is available to it. And you have this usable item part. So we can create like one data here that says on the slot sub item one, we basically can play specific animation when we interact with that, right? So what we want to have is like, eventually as a final result is that the engineer can go to the wall panel, understand this is interacting with the fuse that is on the top or the bottom. And then based on where that object is, it needs to play the right animation to take the, the left, the center or the right. So maybe we should just explain a little bit more what how we play these animations, right? It's uh, it's it goes like it's like um, 
Russian doll thing, like you start one yeah. one, you say, oh, but there is still another piece that we need to explain. And he is like mannequin. So uh, I think I, we could quite easily spend half a day talking about mannequin. It's, absolutely, absolutely. It's, like I said, it's a minefield. Yeah. It's 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 crazy. Like I think yeah, there's a lot of stuff. But basically, in short, what it is is a lot of game engine have what's called an animation graph, right? The animation graph will basically explain how animation state transition from one to another and which type of animation you need to play. And then maybe usually in these animation state, you can maybe say like, you know, with specific uh, conditions, which animation it gets played or how you can randomize through animation, something like this. Mannequin is a kind of a piece of the puzzle. So it's a sort of database where you can use what we call fragment ID and fragment tags to immediately search for a specific animation that match specific condition. The tags are sort of conditions. So you can say like, are you an AI or a player or which type of action are you trying to do? And in our case, let's say, let's go straight like in some example. So it's like, we have like what we call fragment ID that could be usable, usable action, usable face, usable idol. The usable action is the action you can perform when you're in a usable. So we call it usable action. It's just very easy to, to search. And then for example, you have all those folders, those folders are in essence the fragment tags. So it's a sort of when you go in a database and you search for some keys, this is what, what you get and this is the animation results. In our case, we want to understand which animation we need to pick up specific object. In our cases, the wall panel or the relay has three item parts. So how can we identify that? Did the animator and tech animation team give us already something that we can use. So if we go here, if we say, oh, this is the action we want to do, that is the take. So inside take, do we have some version for the world panel? Oh yeah, we do. And then we have two versions that is like high and low. And then we can create, like, we can, we can take a look at those. And we have like, oh, we have a version for center part, left part and right part. And it's the same for the bottom, right? So this is what it means is, one, once we want to search for an action, that is the action take for a wall panel, on the high relay for the fuse that is in the center part zero one, this is the animation we will play, right? And then in the animation, we can also specify specific pro procedural clip layer. That is a sort of, you know, premiere layers, but just like that some play some animation and some play some code. And here it says, when you hit this key, then that item attaches it from the, the relay. Now it passes in your hand and it detaches from the other one. And as you see, we have different animations for, you know, the, the left, you know, and animators can make multiple variation, multiple type of, you know, urgency on doing uh, actions as well. So we can basically pass this information from the behavior and the be and then mannequin takes care of for us to select the right animation. So those are the three that we want to do. It's like center port, uh, center underscore port underscore zero one, left underscore port underscore zero one, right underscore port underscore Zero one. So now we go in here. So just we... just in a nutshell, just so that it's super clear as well what's happening. Essentially, what we're doing is we're just putting these different a bunch of different tags onto the the character, and then they just play whatever animation is associated with all of those tags. So they say, okay, I've got all these different things. That's to this animation. So I'm going to play that. And then in that animation, we can also add like little scripts to say, well, at this point of the animation, you want to trigger this interaction. So, and then that could be like, oh, I'm going to open the door at this point, you know, so just trying to simplify it a bit more. Yep. And there's more here, but we will not see it today, but it's basically a way also to say from the behavior here, it would be like, oh, if I have something attached to this item part, this is the mannequin tag I get. But we can also use this data to say, do you have something attached that respects specific tags? And then basically we can sort it out. Let's say we say, I want to repair this specific fuse. Then we can say like, okay, where is that attached and which animation I need to play? But we could also say, hey, usable, do you have something that is damaged and is a subcomponent attached to you? And then it would be like, yeah, I have three, right? And it's like, oh, just get this one. And this one is the one attached to the uh, item part one. And to use this one, you need to take the left part zero one mannequin uh, tag. This propagates automatically to the behavior later and we'll see. So you're giving it, a collection of choices, not every single choice that's available for every single NPC, because that would be horribly unperformative. But you're, mm -hmm. you're basically giving it uh, its own little buffet of actions. And exactly. based on the situation that it uh, determines, uh, based on all the tags and what's happening, whether something's damaged, whether something's not and whatnot, it, it actually goes, oh, this thing is damaged. 
oh, it's in the left port, so I'm going to use left That tank. animation, exactly. And basically, the good thing is that this comes automatically from what you already have calculated from the AI. So you don't really have, like, you can retrieve this data, but this data can be cached very easily from our code. Because once you attach that object there, then you can immediately say, like, oh, it's attached. OK, cool. Is there some data related to this item port where I attached? That one is like, OK, in the moment you attach it, this is when you calculate it. That means that you know attachment don't happen so often. Right. While you know search happens a lot. If you do it every time you search, then it can be very expensive. But if you do it when you know you do the the bare minimum operation, this is where it can be much more optimal. Cool. So we have this one right now. Seems kind of good, and we can now make the wall panel version. I make a variant here. I will make the usable version. And I uh, will basically start to look at the geometry first here, because this is the one that we are actually interacting with. So it's it's definitely going to be very important to understand if art and animation have defined specific location for us to interact with, right? Because in here, we have this center point that is also sometimes not even reachable here, but we don't really care, because what we care is the description of the actions. But with the wall panel, We'll just open the character tool. We we'll just open. It says character, but it actually opens pretty much anything. And if we open like um, this object, we see that we can debug through, for example, the joints and the joint name. And the front part of the wall panel is something that we call anchor wall panel. And this is the position in which we expect the MPC to align. And this is the same position that we provided to the animation team to make sure that when they make the animation, these are perfectly aligned, you know, and they can perfectly align their hands to the right uh, object, use the right grip, you know, when we play the procedural adjustment and so on and so on. So what we need to do in this case, compared to the other ones is like, first of all, we will add the usable component, of course. Second, this object is not really a carryable. I don't really expect people to just, you know, take away <laughs> like a wall panel from the ship. But we actually have a wall panel uh, set up like um, like archetypes. And then we basically say, as we've seen in Mannequin, there is a fragment tag for the wall panel. It's called wall panel. So we can say, anytime we interact with this object, we carry the wall panel fragment tag with us and we propagate it through the chain. Now we do the alignment slot. The alignment slot in this case would still be called like a main uh, alignment slot, but the helper name would be the one that we have seen here that is uh, anchor wall panel. Let's go a bit. Just don't want to misspell anything. And then we do the use lots. So use lots. In this case, we need two versions, right? I mean, we could use also only one, but I think, you know, this is mostly for readability purpose. Use lot in, like if you have two use lots, doesn't necessarily mean that two people can use it at the same time. Because when people can use it at the same time, when there is a combination of stuff, that is, the alignment slot you're in is free, the use lot that you are associated with is free, and the use channel you you know you want to use, it's free. In our case, we will have two use lots that they reference to the same alignment slot. So you can't basically occupy the same alignment slot by two people, and then it will not work. So in this case, you have like a top one that represents the top uh, relay, and then a bottom one that represents the bottom one. So the fragment tag for the top one it's gonna be called high, as we've seen in Mannequin before. Now, what we do is that we add the use channel instances. So what can we do on the wall panel top? We can look at here, if we search for wall panel, we can see we have a lot of actions. What we care today, we will try to limit to the things that we really care right now. And we can image that is open. Uh, because we want to open it, that panels. If it's closed, we will, should not be able to take something. And what we will do with here is we will put it to the right alignment slot. And then we will add something that is called uh, tags to add on enter and tags to remove on exit. What does this mean is that when 
I'm trying to use some object that is high or low. I want the player to know that it's interacting with the top or the bottom one to branch in the logic. So what we'll do here, we will add a tag to the character automatically when he uses the top one. It's worth mentioning these are game tags as well, not to be confused game with tags. fragment tags. Yeah. That's a classic, yes, things that it's really hard to follow sometimes because we call it all tags. But yeah, these are game tags. Maybe Dan can give like a little bit while I'm, I'm typing. Can you just give yeah, it so, up? So game tags are generally used, I mean, that they're used in every game engine possible. Um, they, they're they a good way of just keeping track of, of literally anything that you want in any um, game element to uh, to do something essentially so if it's a chair you might give it a tag for a chair and then you could search for that chair through that game tag for example um there's there's no end of ways that you can use game tags whereas a mannequin tag is very specific to mannequin and the animations that are being played so a character you know that doesn't have any mannequin tags on them will do literally nothing they'll just stand there um, but then as you start adding those mannequin tags to the character, then they'll start collating all of those and go, oh, well, that means I must have to do this animation. And in here right now, when we're adding these fragment tags, we're saying that if you are in, for example, this alignment slot in front of the wall panel, you're probably going to get a wall panel fragment tag, say, and then that will just be one of those many tags that are required to get the wall panel specific animations. Um, whereas a wall panel game tag would be used um, elsewhere, like um, like I say, in NPC behavior, you would search for a wall panel tag to find that entity. You wouldn't search for a wall panel mannequin tag. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Is and also, yeah, we can do another thing that is called optional game tag. So what it means is for this top used lot we basically know that that one is tagged with a specific game tag. So we say that every use channel, for example, that we interact with in here are related to the top um, you know, uh, interaction, basically state or block. And to achieve that, we go to AI, call it um, top. Sorry, it's absorption, generic location. Then we do the same with the bottom. So this is gonna be a bit of repetitive work. So you know, you guys can talk while I just read or repeat a bit of this. Uh, yeah, so, so what large. Fran's doing right now, adding all of these game tags is so that he's able to reference those in the subsumption logic because you, you wouldn't reference, like I say, mannequin tags in the subsumption logic. So you can say if this, um, if even the character has a game tag of um, top on it, then make sure that you only play logic that is relevant to the top part of the wall panel. If he has a bottom game tag, then... He, you could do logic that's specific to the bottom half of the game, the wall panel instead. Yeah, so basically the tags always, we, we kind of use the game tags to sort of be able to differentiate in the behavior inside subsumption. So basically what Daniel said, like um, when you look at these these graphs from subsumption, it's it's literally just to, to like um, be able to like take like either one path or another path based on the, the game tags on the, uh, the entity. We use a lot of um, logic gates in the subsumption logic with tags in it. They're so fundamental in every game. <laughs> I don't think you'll ever have played a game, you know, at least a, not a modern game that doesn't use tags in some way. Yeah, and tags are also like very important for us because they also represent traits, skill and traits. Maybe Jacob, you can explain a little bit more of that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like for example, when you look at like a, a spaceship, we, we use the tag to be able to like differentiate. Is this like a, like a combat ship or is it like a security ship or like is it a pirate ship or whatever like so we also kind of use text to be able to just to make like see the difference in like what type of you know enemy or what type of ship or whatever that we're uh, like using and yeah, yeah or even with these fuses as well we we have uh, game tags for is this damaged even you know so that yeah. would be the the thing that the npc checks when they inspect it they go they they 
from a visual perspective, it just goes, oh, I'm looking at this fuse. But on, in the logic, what we're doing is saying, does this thing have the damaged tag on it? Because if it does, then we want to make sure we repair it or replace it. If it doesn't, then it's it's okay, and we can just put it straight back in the wall panel. Exactly. It's super broad, the whole game stack system. One thing we will also do here right now is like this is like you know based on my basic template. So as you see in the default loadout, it still loads the relay that is not the usable we just built. So we will basically just go through those objects and we also re replace the entity art class name with the one that we want to really play. So it's like in the template show usable, we put the relay template show usable, the relay template show usable, we basically go in the default loadout. And we now add the sub component to this similar name. So as you see, it's like if you have one type, you, you just need you just need to populate, then it just propagates. You mentioned so yeah, go. Uh, uh, obviously hierarchy is crucial. It's all all of this is this is the Russian nesting doll you mentioned. It's uh, do tags have a priority? Are, are some tags more important than other tags? Like if an NPC recognizes a tag or like a conflicting tag or something, does it does it prioritize one or the other, or does it just jump up on the chair and not know what to do? I think that depends on the logic more than anything. I mean, all tags are created equal. It's just how you use them. Um, whereas mannequin tags, they do have a priority, so they will see um, something like... Um, uh say uh, it was something more important like um how to deal with a file like i'm being shot that's probably going to be a higher priority animation tag than you know just in, like a standard idol for example gotcha. or do you also have hierarchy in uh, in tags as far as i know like for, for instance you can have an entity with like an outfit tag or you can have an entity with like a specific like very specific sort of outfit as well so so you can sort of work with the hierarchy of tags as well in that regard, if you want to sort of make anything like specific behavior based on the, the hierarchical, you know, structure of uh, the text. Yeah, it, just really, it's so fundamentally, you can use them in pretty much any way you like. That's that's one of the, the best things about them. So here, what we are finishing to set up is mostly the same things we did, like the, the, the item parts to understand when things are attached to what. And then... I think I jumped, I just skipped this part to explain, but basically we have also what we call the slotting setup, right? Uh, but we can show it a little bit in a, in a little bit. So what we will do right now is we want to make sure that the, you know, that the engineer can actually find something broken, right? So we go back one second to the behavior and we say like, okay, we usually hide them. But we want sometimes to search, let's say right now in our test uh, map that sometimes we want to search for something else better to do, right? So instead of halting, we just say like, you know, we will just not do anything or idle for something like between every two and three, like and five seconds, right? So you can say like, you know, it starts two is the basic duration, and then we can arrive up to five. So, and every two, three, two, five seconds, we want to try to evaluate something else unless, you know, it immediately finds it. Let's say we want to handle broken, like, sub component so what we want to do is like we want to say this sub activity first of all is high priority compared to the idol so it, it should always be tried you know if possible and if possible means it needs to find some object that actually um is broken basically so we might want to call it uh broken uh sub component so it means that we need to search for any object in the world that is, or I mean, not necessarily in the world, but like around us right now, that is damaged. It would be like this global condition damaged. This is an item. So these are all the game tags. Those are all the game tags, yeah. And that is a sub-component. See, the trick with the tag database is trying to find a tag that already exists and mm -hmm. trying to not create a new tag if it Every one does time. already exist. Yeah. Let's try to make it like that right now. If this gets selected, what we try to do is we basically say something. Since we don't have a line right now, we just create what we call bubbles that are like kind of a 
cartoon uh, message on top of them. I was like, ah, I have found a broken subcomponent. For two seconds, and now we stay here. That we hold for now. Save, you know, we go back in game, close this. Now what we will do is, first we remove the carryable, the back draw, at least we get a bit less the back draw, and then we reload just this one. I go show usable, we put the whole panel. We rotate that, just to make it a bit simpler for the character to go. And then we try to see if right now it finds something and it doesn't find anything. Why? Because there's nothing broken pretty much. So how do we simulate that? We could create like a little mission that just randomly, you know, puts the, the sub components to, to be broken. Sure, it's gonna take a little bit more time. We don't have so much time. So what we will do, we'll mostly just go in our version of the object and we just say that those are all broken. We just, you know, basically assign <laughs> only broken gonna components. Break them. Exactly, right? Mm -hmm. So it's- Yeah, I did damage. the exact same thing. <laughs> Uh, we just like, uh, actually it's not this one, but it is this one. So we save it now. So those objects are there. Usually just delete, we put it back. Now we should be able to, in theory, find this one, but there's no bubble on top. This is because usually we use this as a debug throw. So we need to enable this, what we call the prototype dialog bubbles. We'll put it there, we go in here. Oh, I found the, the broken subcomponent. But unfortunately, it doesn't do anything with that. So it's like, okay, what do we want to do? So now we can ask the NPC to go there and take it, right? Let's let's try to take it. So how do we do that? So it's like, okay. And, so, and, and by the way, it's like, where are those objects right now, right? So, okay, we found them, but how, how do we know which one we found? The system automatically reports these objects into this, this magic variable that get created when you create a new sub-activity that is called required object search results. The only thing is we don't really know and we how or when we're gonna use it, right? Let's say you find 10 objects and there are 10 engineers, then I go to one, you go to another one, then I still think that it's broken because somebody reported to me in the past. So we still need to try to validate if it is still broken. Right now, for simplification, we don't do that. Uh, let's just see how we just, first of all, use that. So let's say we want to use a carryable. So we say like, you know what? I, will, I know those objects are carryable for now. I, you know, I trust, and I just call it sub component. So we can cast similar to how we do with code. Uh, and eventually I really hope to get this away. You know, me and Tony have lots of good plans to make sure that this can automatically inherit and be transformed. But for now, we basically say, we have a lot of objects that we want to cast into usable. The problem is, you know, this is a lot of options. I want to have a bit more control. So what I will do is I will probably just try to make a loop. And I will say, I want to loop until I fail what I'm doing next. And what I'm doing next is mostly popping an object. So I don't want to destroy this variable basically without being very careful. <clears throat> so I want to remove from that variable one object at the, t at the time and make sure that we know what we are doing basically. Subcomponent object. So we say like we take an object out of that and we put it into this other variable. Now, if this fails, it means there's no more object to do. So we can just, you know, uh, do something else. In our case here is like, we could cast it to a usable. This could also fail, but this part, you know, in a way we don't really care right now. So let's say we are okay handling this error with just suppressing the failure and say like, you know what, this is fine for now. And if we need to do some logic, because basically what is important to think is in the behavior flow logic is you want to handle the failure at the point in which you still have the context because the failure means something at that point. So in this case, failing means that I don't have any more object, but in this case, it means this object is not the type that I was expecting. So I could, in theory, add also something here that is, um, it's in core, I think, that we call bubble error, that are a sort of 
this bubble that we use for prototype, but also report an error similar to how we do code when we do a cert and it's like, you know what, this logic is wrong. I think you wrote something previously that is wrong is reporting you some object that is not correct. Of course, it could be data error. This is why we don't crash like an assert might do in code, but you know, we still report it a bit harsh and there is a pop-up that comes out and says like, you know, are you sure you, you, know, you need to review your logic here? And in release, of course, this doesn't, doesn't do anything. But anyway, we can move this one. Now we have an object that now we can do an action. That is, we want to use this object that is a usable. And what we can do here is we can take it. We walk to there, you know, and we just use whatever we can. Like if there are multiple use lot or whatever, but right now this is not really important. So let's see if this now works because there will be stuff that is missing. And you see, this is this is failing right now. So why? Because right now this object is not just in the world, it's attached to other objects. And this is where we need to explain the system how the routing works. And routing means how a function call gets transported into the larger objects, for example. So it's like, well, I know you want to use the fuse, but to use the fuse, you need to interact with the relay. You say, I know you want to interact with the relay, but to interact with the relay, you yeah, actually need to use the wall panel, right? So what we'll do now is we will set up this information on the object here. So, so maybe you guys you know, can, while I, yeah, while yeah, I said that. that we, you're going into a little bit of overtime here. Just so this yes, I, I've, we finished this one and then I just show you the logic and I think, you know, we need to shorten a little bit what I expected. Or we can just drag, no, if it doesn't work, we can just drag like the one that I remember and I can show you. Yeah, we haven't even started on the engineer behavior yet. I yeah, know, right? It's very difficult to cover such a big uh, behavior in such a short amount of time. <laughs> and it's one of the more complica complicated behaviors that we've worked on. So <laughs> as you yeah. know, Dan. <laughs> well, These yeah. one and the bartender are the really complicated one. Oh, we know how a complicated bartender is. Some of us did eight different segments on the bartender before it was done. Yeah, and we're going to call this part one then, part one of many. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll do uh, part two engineer in a few weeks. <laughs> so basically, what we are saying here is that to interact with the slots, the slot sub item two, we need to pass through the use lot main, and then we already I was already setting up before just to speed up, but I think I didn't finish it. So it's like there is team. In the wall panel, instead, as you can see, say we have this other slot stuff that says, "Oh, to interact from the top, you can you need to pass through the top high or top or bottom low uh, use slot." So we can now see delete this just for safety. See the guy now moves there. He knows how to interact with that. It's actually I I used the wrong alignment slot here. It seems like. Uh, and this is why it's not uh, set up correctly. Let me try to look at which one I, I wrote. I probably I copied the wrong one. For wall panel. Right. While Fran, while Fran but is working, it's fine. Yeah. While Fran is working, I'll pose, I'll pose a question to everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, wh wh why do NBCs love standing on chairs so much? <laughs> I think Fran's answered that a few times already, haven't you? It's, it's one of those yes. things. I, I mean, I've, I've, been, I've answered it when I've been doing Star Citizen streams as well. It's, it's one of those those kind of bugs that has the exact same visual output, but it has lots of causes. things that can cause. Yeah, exactly. So you, you fix it one way and then the next week you've, you've got the exact same visual output, but it's a completely different bug. It's, yeah. it's just one of those. Yeah. No, yeah, really like yeah there's, there's so many things going into like the usable code that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really a jungle sometimes to, to sort of figure out what exactly is causing this bug. So yeah, definitely. It could be like uh, a missing animation. It could be the animation names changed. It could be the setups changed slightly by accident in the parent above the variant. So it could be absolutely anything. <laughs> I, I remember one recent. It was caused by um, people leaving the area. Then the NPCs that were still sitting in the seats, um, they basically got you know turned off. And then when a play came back, they were turned back on, but the game didn't um, put them sitting correctly in the seat anymore. So they were just standing on it instead. Yeah, there are like tons of, of problems basically that are causing that. And they're mostly 
coming from the streaming right now. This is why, like, you know, I, I'm the first one that hates that bug. You know, it's just that I think it's always like uh, the problem is that the eye is at the end of the chain. So every time something gets improved, right, and you know, we get this like this side effect that they all look like the same bug. This is the wrong one. <laughs> Most likely are not. So we had like this, uh, as you see right now, he just took all the objects and he just dropped them all, of course, like, you know, but it's uh, it's kind of cool. It just went with all the animations and he played all, all those objects. Um, I never had that one, friend. So you've done something new so, there. No, because I just looping, I'm just looping through the take only, like, right? So it's like take one, then he takes the next one, he takes the next one, he takes the next one, and that's the only thing he does right now. But it's, uh, yeah, for the standing on the chair, basically this is what we are trying right now. I will want to basically dedicate some time. We will dedicate some time to make a proper plan. You know, I, I'm I'm scheduling sometimes because I'm I'm a bit uh, tired of seeing it. Of course, like eventually, what my I really want to have like a proper animation of a guy yeah. standing on the chair for like just on purpose, you know. And it would be like gotcha, you know, and the like, like a one in one thousand NPC. One in one thousand, you know, it will happen, and you know, the, 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 that part is pretty fun. He's yes, in, in, we need to do it. Uh, but yeah, it's basically a lot to do. Sometimes, for example, we don't know when something streams out that it will eventually come back. That right. we we can't right now guarantee it because we don't have yet the the proper persistence, you know, of that stuff. So it's like we we either reserve that object for somebody that might never come back, or it might come back with a different idea right now and sometimes sometimes and it's like eh, this was yours but now you can't use it because you reserved for somebody then it's never gonna come back so we are not doing it and then of course sometimes what happens is you know another npc actually sits there before and this one you see sometimes two npc one next to each other but the streaming takes too long you know and then the guy's already there but there are also in place already lots of uh, fallbacks. And whenever we find them, we basically had them. And then we try to recover from some of the situations right now as well. Uh, so there, are, there is a lot of little pieces because with the population manager, of course, this is meant to be different, right? When when NPCs goes away, you know, those will be repopulated by the population manager. So this is why, like, in a way, this is not real a problem that will exist in the future, right? You know, because it's uh, it basically with our plan that is already a known problem in a way. Or the fact that the guys just come back for just because the stream is the streaming kicks in, right? But then there is like, of course, the stuff that there might be some bugs sometimes with the with the LOD update. We try to be efficient in updating stuff that is not visible, and maybe that one fails to attach, you know. And, and we are we are searching for some of this stuff. So there is like, yeah, as Dan said. Same visual problem with with several bugs that we are you know constantly fixing and some new optimization things might still get back. Anyway, I think we are pretty much like yeah. at the end. But the only thing I wanted to show you is basically these things how the actual logic works. Uh, you know, it's going to be like just the last two minutes. If we go on the wall panel when we do take, what do we do? We basically still say like, oh, I want to open the panel, no matter what. I want to try to open it, and then in the open, this is where all the game tags we have set up uh, come into play, because basically we what, what we try to do is, for example, we try to see say, are we on the top? Are we interacting with the top, or are we interacting with the bottom? I mean, this is really for safety, because in theory, if you're not interacting with the top, you should be interacting with the bottom. But then we say like, oh, is the object actually having some tags? Like, is he open? If it's not open right then we want to open it but if it's open that's fine so it's a sort of like building on top of the logic we already have without having to duplicate too much logic right because at the end of the day use channels for our you know internal logic are just functions we can just call function and then just let them execute if necessary right uh, and of course like whenever we see like is this real a problem or performance something that we can have some early out or other double checks and we can optimize this but this gives us like a very scalable solution first of all for the logic you know and and then the take says like okay after I open now i'm in a state in which i know that it's been open the player could have opened before right even if the eye is really precise we'll always close all the all the doors we can never guarantee that you know because player could troll around or actually okay. may have forgotten because maybe i don't know the eye as well my combat started while they were repairing something right and now they are back it, after it also one means hour. It yeah, it also means that we're able to have NPC behavior that just goes around closing all the wall panels. Absolutely. And they're like, oh, we'll open that. Actually, it could even feel wrong. Like, you know, there could be guys in a state in which they say, I expect everything to be closed. If something has opened, 
maybe there's somebody here not expecting, right? And this we could also uh, build on top of that. It's gonna be and one guy and like, a javelin just walking around, closing all the doors. It's like, it's just hot man. There's it, somebody always opening these wall panels. And that's why it's so cool. Sorry, that's why it's so cool. I was just saying it. It like substantially it's like super generic like in, in mm -hmm. like how we sort of uh, modularize it and split up everything into tasks and that's what makes it so cool because uh, we can sort of do whatever we basically want you know we can we can chain the tasks uh, in every way we want and we can sort of make like um like so many different behaviors to, like because of this modularity yeah um, and this is the other magic uh magic task that is taking all the data we put it there and says which object which mannequin tags i need to use to interact with that object and then it will get that one from the item part and then we merge it from you know it's like there is like some variable here that get populated by the code that says like oh you are ready in a take that means that you already need to use take for your action you already need to use wall panel because we propagate there and then we also can guarantee that for example we can uh, say like you know what you're trying to take the wall panel you just can't do it but if you're taking something inside, we can always, uh, we have two variables that basically tells us which usable we are in. In this case, for example, the usable variable contains the wall panel and it's like, we want to open the wall panel. We don't want to take the wall panel, but then we want to interact with a way with the item to take, you know, that is actually coming as well from the routing, you know, and it's the initial routing usable that is like, I started from the fuse and I arrived to the wall panel. So we have all these little pieces uh, that has been, you know, implemented in all those years, basically, you know, and especially with the, the bartender helped us a lot and the engineer is helping us a lot, uh, you know, then basically started to do this use channel inception, you know, and I was, and I'd be, I would say, oh, oh my God, use, Dan, use this is like, of use channels. yeah, this is yeah. scary. And I was saying, actually, this is really cool. You know, as like, we can make it working yeah, very well. It's, and, it's yeah. literally the only thing that, you know, only a designer could think of that. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I was like, and I usually know. It's like, if it's possible in the tool, you guys will do it. One hundred percent. Like you. Yeah, I, 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 I joked about how many you know, segments, how many times we covered the bartender, but really, the value of all that work, you know, wasn't just the bartender. It was, yeah. it was, it was creating this infrastructure that you've been showing us for this last hour, uh, that we can now apply to everything from engineers to pilots to, to you name it. I think Absolutely. we could probably do um, a better job of simplifying this because no, like that's, this that's kind of, kind of what, what, we're, what we're going through right now is is years worth of you know research and tech development and we're just kind of coming out as probably a bit of verbal yes. diarrhea, but it's yeah. it's um, we, yeah, we, we need to we need to make it faster for designers. This is this is our next goal. Is of course like for example, we have a tool we are working on that is the usable builder, right? I think some of those features are not yet supported in there. This is why I'm, I didn't show it today. But the goal is to have these tools where, you know, you have a bit a bit easier like click approach compared to like the data for structure is mostly, you know, it's this data content. But you know, you don't necessarily have to interact with that, right? It, like right. you might have a tool that is much more visual that allows you to you know to click here, and say, oh, I click on this uh, item part, cool, I want to add this data directly, and then it automatically propagates, right? This is our goal. Right. You build the system, and then you build the tools to make the system absolutely usable. Yeah, sometimes we do it in parallel, but you know, then it means also that you're a bit slower in developing the system and it depends about the priority of the company as well, what you want to deliver. I mean, it was only a couple of years ago that the concept of use channels didn't even exist. And yet we still had usables in the game. Well, we've got a little over 1,200 people watching live who all are ready to create NPCs now. Thank you guys for you know all the attention that it was. I hope like again it for me it feels always like that is not enough what I'm showing right. But I think it could be nice to also get the feedback from people like whatever they want to see we can show it next time you know. Uh, uh, Hayden, I, before I let you go, I have to mention your your, your RGB chair. <laughs> Why? Where, thank you. Yeah, where did you get the RGB cycling. chair? It's the hundred million PewDiePie limited <laughs> edition chair. Have to represent. Oh no! <laughs> Man, I'm one of cool. them. I'm sorry. Discreet current no, cool. just it's went cool. straight down the toilet. That's to be one. Come on. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. that's where that's where we'll end the show. Uh, thanks, Fran, Dan, Jacob, Idris, and Hayden. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of the end of your week uh, to be here on the show. Uh, 
I understand you're the only studio that doesn't have Monday off, right? No. <laughs> we <have it> the <laughs> but the but the third is off in, in Germany, so uh, we have we have. Yeah, you guys have, you guys have plenty of bank holidays, but you, you enjoy the the one day you guys have to work, and we'll all be off <laughs> on Monday. We'll be so once tight. A year. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, guys, this has been Star Citizen Live Game Dev Building NPC Behaviors. I am was your I was your host, uh, Jared Huckabee. Uh, we'll see you next week, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys. It was a pleasure. See you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> PewDiePie chair? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's right.